<laughs> well, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, clearly, this is just going to be a casual panel. <laughs> Uh, so good afternoon to everyone joining us. Um, thanks for coming to the, w the West Virginia Collegiate Recovery Conference, the first one in the state. Uh, I'm Olivia Dale Pape. I'm the director of the WVU Collegiate Recovery Program, and I will be your moderator for our next session, uh, Voices of Collegiate Recovery, Perspectives from Students, Alumni, Staff, and Allies. Just a few housekeeping items. If you would like continuing education credits or a certificate, please sign in and complete the evaluation in order to provide us, uh, or in order for us to provide a certificate. And I think that information's already in the chat. Uh, yep, the link to the form and evaluation are in the chat. And if you think of any questions during our panel, please feel free to put them in the chat box or, box or in the Q&A as well, and that will be monitored. Um, cool. So before I introduced all of our amazing panelists, of which there are many, um, I want to take a moment to tell a bit of my story and introduce myself. So as I mentioned, um, I'm the director of the WVU Collegiate Recovery Program. I am also a person in long-term recovery from an eating disorder, and I'm a recovery ally. I am also one of the founding members of our program here at West Virginia University, so I wear lots of hats. Uh, so I moved to West Virginia in 2015 from Los Angeles, um, chasing a boy, of course, and I quickly found myself in a place with very limited recovery resources. Um, I knew from my experience that if I didn't have ongoing support, if I didn't have a community of others who had shared experiences and were also walking the path of recovery, um, I wouldn't succeed. I would not be able to sustain my own recovery. I also knew that if I was experiencing this lack of resources and this great fear of, you know, what do I do um, for support, that likely other people were going through that as well. Um, so through a series of kind of fateful events and very wordy Google searches, um, I stumbled upon Dr. Kathy Ura's email and I connected with her about, you know, what sort of things the university was offering related to recovery. She welcomed me with open arms as she does everyone, told me about a program they were just trying to get off the ground, asked me to come to the next meeting, uh, and the rest is history. But, or actually like it's really more involved than that, but that sounds best. Mm -hmm. um, as a fun fact, when I was getting ready to move here, I was thinking about what I wanted to do you know, with my life professionally, because my background is in fashion, and I knew I wasn't going to do that in West Virginia. Um, and I thought, wouldn't it be so great if universities had some sort of program for students who were living in recovery? I thought I created collegiate recovery programs. <laughs> it turns out that was the 70s. Um, so without our collegiate recovery program here at WVU, I never would have been able to go back to school. Um, I ended up getting my master's in public health, but as a lifelong perfectionist, I knew that school would bring with it an onslaught of anxiety, um, stress, and ultimately a desire to control something or think I have a sense of control. Um, and that often for me historically has meant a return to disordered behaviors. So without our collegiate recovery program, I wouldn't have had the confidence that I could survive, you know, my master's program. And I did it. I went to school full time. I worked full time while training for marathons. And I still was able to do my recovery full time. I was still able to show up for it and show up for others because I had so much support all around me. Um, I really found myself through this program and I found my career through this program. I have gone from community member to student member to field placement student to secondary appointment and now to director. I've been in this role since April. So, you know, there's so much for students if they're given an opportunity to thrive. And for me, this is what I needed. And I felt challenged by the program. I feel inspired by the people in it. You know, five years ago, I could never have imagined being here and you know it's it's totally imperfect and there's still days I struggle and I really don't have any answers whatsoever but I have a lot of experience and I have a lot of hope 
Um, and while I know this might sound very preachy, and like I'm just marketing collegiate recovery programs, and technically that is one of my jobs, um, but you know it's all true. And I'm I'm honored to get to be here today to speak with all of you, and you know to speak with these panelists and help them get the word out, um, answer some questions, and you know just share their journey with the world. So. Now I am pleased to introduce our speakers for the Voices of Collegiate Recovery panel. So Dr. Kathy Yura is the founding director of the WVU Collegiate Recovery Program, who is now enjoying retirement and remains on the advisory board um, for the WVU Collegiate Recovery Program. Drew O'Connell is a student and a member of the WVU Collegiate Recovery Program. Uh, Jamie Minshaus, Luckmanova is the Peer Recovery Support Specialist for Marshall University Collegiate Recovery Community. Andrew Carl is the Program Coordinator for the WVU Collegiate Recovery Program and is an alumni of our program. And Annette Johnson is the Peer Recovery Support Specialist for Bridge Valley Community and Technical College. I want to thank all of our speakers for taking time out of their busy schedules to share with us. Um, your experiences are important, your stories are important, and I know our attendees are going to benefit from hearing about them. So now we're going to let each panelist introduce themselves, um, telling a little bit about their story and their experiences as they relate to collegiate recovery. So Kathy, you are up first. Okay, well, first of all, thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of this because I did retire and, um, and I work privately now as a psychologist and I get to refer a lot of students to the program, but um, I thought my internet would be better here. And as this started, uh, the building went blank. <laughs> so I'm using my phone and I'm sorry that the, it's kind of dull. Um, but the story is a great one because uh, many of the people in recovery know the name Tom Bennett. And it was back around 10 years ago, and I was overseeing a program called Well WVU, and that's when I met Olivia, um, that he came and he, I had not, I really didn't know much about collegiate recovery. And he invited myself and some others to come tour Texas Tech program. And it just so happened like this weekend, Texas Tech was playing WVU. And King Gray, my vice president, had a friend there was getting an award. So Brian uh, Quigley and Jim Barry and I, uh, we all flew down and toured uh, Texas Tech's program. And I think you heard from Kristen Harper. She was our tour guide. And it just so happened it was the 25th year of Texas Tech's program. So Kitty Harris was there and I mean, there were hundreds of alums from their program. And it really planted a seed in King Gray's mind that this, this really would be successful. And um, it was also the opiate epidemic beginning. And uh, so he said, yes, this sounds really good. Well, as it was, we came back and then that's how I met Susie. Uh, she and some of her colleagues, uh, George Daugherty and, and Joe Deegan came up from Charleston, he was alum. And we got Andrew, which I had not seen for years, he was part of it. Um, and there were a number of others, Doug Leach, and we just had a table full of people who met for I think a couple years. So it wasn't a, a real quick fix. Um, we kept trying to think about what was in the community what would work best for WVU. Every collegiate recovery program was a little different. And I'm telling you, it, I mean, it was a dream team because uh, finally, um, Jim Stevenson, who was overseeing Chestnut Ridge, found a way to get a space. And I think once we got space, we were able to really take off. Um, it was a collection of ideas from everyone, so I wouldn't say there's one type of collegiate recovery program, but I think we found a, a, a formula that was tremendous. Um, Merweiss Hadar, I see he's on. Um, a lot of the young men from uh, Jacob's Ladder would come down, and we started understanding what would really create a good program. Um, I want to say that 
the probably the inspiration was uh, George Daughtery, who kept telling me after every one of those meetings, Kathy, whatever you do, make sure that people have fun. Nobody's going to come to a program unless they have fun. Um, so we have fun. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, I was at WVU for 40 years. And my last five years was the most fun I'd ever had at WVU. Um, I think, first of all, the students that came to this program, listening to their stories, watching them talk to different groups, uh, both in the community, at Rotary, to you know, church groups, to all the classes, uh, the courage, the... Um, ability to help people understand both the struggle and the freedom recovery gave them. And it, I mean, that was inspiring. And it was, uh, it truly was, you know, just Susie found this incredible uh, artwork uh, from Ruth Blackwell Rogers that made our house just become a showcase. Um, and then we had, you know, just wonderful community members wanting to try to support this effort. And we had got donations. So we got to have some fun. We got a retreat at Canaan. We went to Carnegie Mellon's art show and had dinner. I mean, we got out and about in the community and we had a good time. We had lots of outings, um, both ventures and uh, and in. We had parties. We tried to party everything. Anybody had a celebration, you know, we, we really, we did well. We made great food. But I think I'm going to credit Andrew with this one. Andrew had heard of the Blue Zone. So right before the Blue Zone really took off at WVU, uh, we started adopting the whole understanding of the Blue Zone, having meditation, yoga, um, you know, book studies, um, just a wellness thing. And we also had a rule in the house that nobody could ask anybody why they were there. And because it was all inclusive with recovery, I think that also was why it worked so well. Probably the hardest things were, of course, relapses. Um, and, if, and if a student died, uh, that was, that's, those are tough. And, um, but, you know, as a group, everyone would circle each other and help e lift each other up. And it, you know, it became, you know, strong. We became strong out of our, our times of, of even suffering and, and disappointments. I also think another tough thing was when other departments didn't quite understand like the why we were doing it. And, uh, but, you know, I think today when I got, when I retired, I think the, the momentum was, is beautiful. And I can see the, the, the future for collegiate recovery is very, very good. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Um, Drew, feel free to start when you're ready. Hi, everyone. My name is Drew O'Connell. Um, so a little bit about myself. So I'm, I'm 31. Um, I really didn't understand what school was until recently. Um, I came here. So I was born in Wheeling. I came here from, uh, from Maui, Hawaii is where my, my last stop was. And uh, in Maui, you know, after years of addiction, I was, I was pretty broken. Um, the first time I went around to school, I got into a car accident. Uh, it was during exam week. I, uh, I lost my financial aid because my grades were, were, were you know, they weren't worthy. And, uh, and I blamed that on everyone but myself till recently. Um, and, uh, and I ran away from my addiction. I traveled for a long time and it always found me. Um, and, and at my last stop, uh, I was in Maui and I was homeless and I had nothing. And I, and I mean nothing. And someone saw a light in me and, and it was a treatment center and, uh, and it was called Jacob's Ladder. And what they would do was, is when I got there, there was techs on and they had one tech watch you for 24 hours, about 13, 12, 10 guys, anywhere in that area. And uh, what they would do is they were students down here and then they were, they were in recovery and they were having fun and, and enjoying life. And for so many years, I chased that and I didn't know how to do it. 
I didn't know what recovery was. I didn't understand the aspect of it. And, and I had no clue you could go to school and recover, not even the slightest bit of clue. And, uh, and I, as soon as I got to that treatment center, I, I learned that my way didn't work. And I started taking their suggestions and then um, said this earlier, you know, I lived vicariously through all those guys. Every time they'd come up, I'd just ask them about a class or a homework assignment or they'd sit in the office and they'd do their English and their math and their science and their psychology. And honestly, I'd just sit next to them. I wouldn't say a word. I'd just watch them do their homework. And I wanted it so bad. I just had no clue how to chase it. So when I got out of Jacob's Ladder, uh, I kept that dream. And I went to Sober Living, Jacob's Ladder Sober Living, which is pretty close to the WU campus. And I started, you know, asking Susie and Kathy. And then I met Andrew and, and, uh, they helped me get into school. I mean, we pulled a lot of teeth to, to get into school. I mean, me and Kathy, we, I think, geez, the emails and the letters and the running around and, and the financial aid, uh, it took everything out of us, but she never gave up. No one gave up on me, you know, collegiate recovery here. You know, I, but the first time around, I, I said this earlier, Susie asked me, the other day, you know, what's the difference between, you know, school at West Liberty and school now? I was alone at West Liberty. WU Collegiate Recovery, it never lets me be alone. No matter what I'm going through, no matter if it's, I have no clue how to, how to get a credit card, card or pay a bill or put the electric bill on my name or study for that psychology test or my favorite tutor, Fagan, you know, I, I got two A's in English. When I, got, when I got into school, my biggest fear was English because I failed every English class when I was my first time around. The tutoring, the yoga, the mindfulness, the whole, the whole aspect of, you know, be mindful and, and, and compassionate. That's it's, it's the walls of WU Collegiate Recovery, you know, in a whole. And uh, yeah, and now I, my little brother came to WU this year. He lives with me, you know, and the first thing that happened when he got here is, he started asking me questions and all of a sudden I could re remember, you know, asking Susie and Kathy and Andrew all the same questions, you know, where's this building? How do I get to this class? Do I have enough time to get to this class? How do I do it? You know, I found myself answering those questions with ease because collegiate recovery gave them to me with ease and, and they taught me and I learned. And um, now I have, you know, scholarships. I was awarded two scholarships to go to school and I can't tell you how much that helps me. I just can't put into words. I, I, I work full time. Um, I have, you know, 19 year old little brother who's a little rambunctious. So I have that to take care of as well. And it's, it's not, it's, it's not easy at times, but you know, my scholarships and the people, you know, that, that got me here, they are still right next to me. You know, they're still in my text messages. They're still my phone calls. And uh, yeah. And so, you know, I came from a tent to two scholarships and an incredible family inside, you know, collegiate recovery. So I can't, uh, I'll, ne I'll never be able to repay them. But every time I try to figure out what my future is going to be, you know, all I know is I love school and everyone around me has very, very attractive jobs. So I just keep listening to the suggestions that's given to me and go from there. That's what I got. Thank you. Thanks, Drew. We're lucky to have you. Uh, Jamie, you are up next. All right, um, my name is Jamie Mensas Lekmanova and I am the recovery coach for Marshall University Collegiate Recovery Community. And I'm really sorry guys, I'm also really short. Um, so my head's all the way down here. Um, so, oh gosh, where to start? Um, I'm a person in long-term recovery um, from alcohol and other drugs and pretty much anything that is not good for you, but feels great. Um, I've been in recovery for next year. Well, the beginning of next year will be four years. Um, if I were to go back in time and tell four years ago, Jamie, hey, this is what you're gonna be doing. I would not have believed me at all. Um, so whenever I first got into recovery, I got in recovery because of my family, because I wanted to make them proud, and I wanted to be sure that I was there for my family. Um, I am from Kentucky, and I originally worked as a peer there for about a year and a half, a year unpaid as a volunteer, and then six months 
whenever they paid me. And I absolutely loved it. I worked at a youth drop-in center and I worked with specifically youth who had been where I had been, you know, five years before that, which was, you know, homeless, struggling, and overall just trying to get where I needed to be. So that started out with me getting a lot of our youth enrolled in college. Um, then I looked across the river to West Virginia in Huntington and I found a job application for Harmony House, which is working with a transient population. So I applied there and they said, so you have experience with youth. We're trying to open a youth drop-in center here in Huntington. I was like, okay, great. I'm wanting to go to Marshall. Like it would be really helpful to be closer to the school that I want to go to eventually. And then I got a call from who is now my boss, Ken Fitzwater, to be like, so we're actually doing collegiate recovery. And I had no idea what that was, like whatsoever. I did not know that there could be a recovery community on a college campus. And it completely blew my mind. I started looking more into it. I, of course, looked up Texas Tech because they're the first one that pops up whenever you put in collegiate recovery. Um, looked at a whole bunch of different programs because I wanted to have a good understanding of this. I had gone to college whenever I was in active addiction and I did not finish because of my life decisions and because of my active addiction. And I found out that the college that I had gone to now has its own collegiate recovery program. And I was like, what? I wish they would have had that <laughs> whenever I was on campus. Um, and it really made me think that, you know, that was a time whenever I really needed it was coming out of high school, going into college. And it made me realize how many people probably also need that. Um, and it just opened a whole other world. I started delving really deep into allyship, into recovery friendly campus, into a trauma informed campus, talking with people on our campus about, you know, if and, and, you know, when we're going to have students on campus, we already do have students on campus who are in recovery, they're going to need support. They're going to need people to not stigmatize them or label them or think that they can't because of, you know, what's in their past. Um, and talking to people about, you know, having open conversations about alcohol and drug use with students of, if you're going to be using, let's make sure that, you know, you guys are being safe no matter what, and that we're going to try and limit your use and that if you need help, we're going to get you to that support system that's going to give you some help. And it's gone just beyond amazing overall. Anytime I go and talk to someone on Marshall's campus or off of Marshall's campus, I usually get a couple very excited, what do you mean we have that on campus? That's amazing. You know, West Virginia as a whole is just really come together um, where, where it's concerned for, you know, the opioid epidemic, like really kind of honed in on that, you know, famil familial kind of just, you know, round the bandwagons, we're going to stick together and we're going to get through this. And it's amazing to, you know, come here and to see everything that's going on with, you know, collegiate recovery and within our communities to just overall really support each other and to support those who can't do it themselves. So thank you guys for having me today. Thanks, Jamie. It's really great to hear more of your story. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, I wish this would have existed when I was in school. And sometimes it's like, it did. You just didn't know about it. So um, next up is Andrew. Hey, everybody. I'm Andrew Carl. I'm the program coordinator with WVU Collegiate Recovery. Um, I'm also an alum of the university, an alum of our collegiate recovery program. I'm also a person in long-term recovery. Um, so I, initially, I came to school at WVU way back in 2002 as an individual with a very severe substance use disorder already. Um, and there really wasn't any kind of support system like a collegiate recovery or peer recovery coaches. And, um, you know, I, I can definitely empathize with like that feeling of being on your own. And for an 18 year old with a substance use disorder, that's, you know, that's overwhelming. Um, when I came back to school 
in 2016. Um, I did hear about the collegiate recovery program. I started showing up because um, I learned that being a service and being a part of a community are two of the great ways to sort of grow in my recovery. Um, and I say to me, like the, the greatest gift this program has given me is not only a place to belong, but they've given me the room to grow and develop a positive identity in recovery. They've allowed me to be a leader in this community. Um, from an undergrad volunteer who was given the freedom and the support to develop programming to a graduate assistant and to a program coordinator. Um, really like, you know, I wouldn't, I, I don't know where I would be, but I certainly wouldn't um, have the faith and belief in myself as a person in recovery without the support of this program. And it really is, it's, it's a super diverse group of people and stakeholders on the WVU campus that they want to help and they want to support students in recovery. And it, it's just been, you know, the best experience of my life to be a part of a community like this. And, you know, we're, I look forward to working with the other programs in West Virginia and, you know, it's a, it is, it's a beautiful thing to be a part of. Um, I'm just glad to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. You know, our program really would not be at all what it is without Andrew. So my best advice to people trying to start a program is get yourself an Andrew, but you can't have ours. Uh, so finally, uh, last but not least, let's hear from Annette. Hey, everybody. My name's Annette Johnson. And I am the Collegiate Recovery Coach at Bridge Valley Community and Technical College. Um, to tell you guys a little bit about myself, um, I was in active addiction for about 10 years, which ultimately led to my incarceration. After that, um, someone very close to me um, I found out had a substance use disorder. When I found that, out because they, they were so close to me, I went and found the nearest Narcan training. After that, um, I had a, a doctor's appointment, just a well check with my primary care physician, and she was asking me questions, and I told her about my background, and she suggested that I take the Recovery Coach Academy, and she told me it was at Bridge Valley. I looked it up. It started the next day. So I couldn't get a hold of anybody. I just showed up in the class. And um, during that class, I met, who's my boss now, Carla. Um, and how you say it here in West Virginia, she took a liking to me. And uh, she gave me information about the Collegiate Recovery Program. Um, they had, I guess, dipped their toes a little bit in the water uh, with the Collegiate Recovery Program, but didn't have anybody uh, staff full-time. So about uh, a year later, I um, had an interview and took the job. Um, I was, I'm a graduate from Concord University who also now has a Collegiate Recovery Program. Somehow throughout my active addiction, I managed to graduate college, but you know, like, Jamie said, and Olivia said that she hears people say all the time, you know, I just wonder what my life would have been like if, if there was a collegiate recovery program at Concord during the times that I was attending, um, how it could have changed. And so like my job now, what I strive to do is just to let people hear the things that I needed to hear when I was 17, 18, 20, you know, years old. And at Bridge Valley, we have traditional students, non-traditional students, and I can relate to those students because I was a single mom in college, and it's just, it's really rewarding. I love my job. The knowledge I have gained from the trainings that Susie um, has provided for us and that I do with other peer recovery coaches, it's just the knowledge I'm just so happy just to be informed and stuff that I didn't know before. And I can relay that to other students, faculty and staff. The faculty and staff at Bridge Valley have 
been so, you know, accepting of the program. I get their full support, you know, anything I ask, they, they approve it and let me do it. So the we've been doing community outreach events and those are my favorite to do because it's not, you know, we do stuff for the students, but we also include the community in our events. And I really enjoy doing that. Um, you know, helping others helps me and I'm just really glad to find my purpose in life. And that's with the collegiate recovery program. Thanks, Olivia. Thanks, Annette. They are lucky to have you at Bridge Valley. Um, cool, guys. So now we're going to get into some questions and answers. Again, everyone attending, please feel free to pop in any questions that you may have into the Q&A or the chat. Um, someone is monitoring that. Speakers, remember that anyone is free to answer any of the questions. There's no specific order. Um, just shout it out if you feel it. So the first one, we're just going to get down to the basics. Um, and the question is, how do you define recovery? Or what does recovery mean to you? I'll just say real quick, I think Annette touched on purpose in life. And for me, a large part of recovery has been embracing life, embracing sort of this, this journey, looking at myself, um, accepting myself and really searching for what provides meaning and purpose in my life. And really this program, again, they gave me the platform and the opportunity and the support to do that. And, you know, you hear, you'll hear it over and over again from people in recovery because it's true. We find meaning and purpose um, of being service to others. Um, so for me, that's, that's a large part of recovery is that ability to get out of, uh, you know, my, my own sort of self-centered little world and to be a part of something bigger than just me and to help other people the way I was helped um, for me in large part you know that's what recovery is day in and day out and it really is like it's the opposite of the way I lived my life when I had an active substance use disorder. So Olivia we have a question in the, the Q&A. Um, Cool. Did, did you find it hard to get the students to open up as a new recovery coach on campus? Also, how do you get students to engage more when they're kind of isolated? All right. Anyone want to take this one? I can half take it. Um, <laughs> um, I think it is a challenge to get people to open up about active addiction. It's not difficult to get people to open up about recovery so long as they feel safe um, and that they're not going to be judged, judged for being in recovery. As soon as I bring up recovery, I usually have like five people being like, hey, I'm in recovery from, you know, mental health. I'm in recovery from, you know, this, or I used to ha have struggles with this whenever I was younger, you know, Everybody wants to talk about not just their recovery, but their progress. Everybody wants to talk about that. The struggle gets whenever you're trying to engage with students who are in active addiction and getting them to open up. Um, at least in my experience, that is a bit of a struggle. Um, and what was the other part of the question? I think we like, here we go. It's an answer. I found it. How do you... Um, so pre-COVID, it was overall pretty easy for me to engage with students. I could just walk on campus. I could be like, hey, what's up? Um, I, you know, would go to classrooms and I would talk about, you know, recovery and even being a recovery ally. And I would get quite a few people that come into my office to be like, hey, like I want to talk about at least the allyship part. Um, Post-COVID, that is a little harder. Um, I still think we try in a similar way, which is, you know, sending out videos of recovery doing virtual recovery all events um, and trying to at least digitally engage with students. Thanks, Jamie. Yeah, so just as a reminder, guys, the question is, did you find it 
hard to get the students to open up as a new recovery coach on campus. Also, how do you get students to engage more when they're kind of isolated? Um, and one thing I would say is that we have had the most success with word of mouth. Our students are our greatest ambassadors, which I think is true ac across everything in higher ed. But, you know, having our students, especially ways in which we're engaged in the community with some of the, you know, sober communities or treatment centers with Jacob's Ladder, getting involved, talking about the program, letting people know. Um, we can put out as many marketing materials as we want, and I do think there's a time and a place for a marketing plan, but it is always, oh, so-and-so told me about this program. Um, that is our number one. So does anyone else have anything to add to that question? Cool, well, we will move on. Um, kind of similarly talking about how students are isolated. You know, I wonder if you guys would talk a little bit about obstacles and opportunities you have experienced either in your role or as a student in collegiate recovery um, during COVID, because we know it's been a while now and things have really changed. So any, you know, difficulties, um, any successes during COVID? I will um, answer that. So I think that, well, I know that the collegiate, re uh, the collegiate recovery program at Bid Bridge Valley has grown since COVID offering virtual meetings um, gave uh, the students an opportunity to join from the comfort of their own home. You know, sometimes it can be intimidating walking into a room full of people that you do not know. Um, so I have had a lot more response since COVID started with the virtual meetings. I think that we offered um, yoga. We connected with the Phoenix uh, sober community and we joined them for yoga once a week, which that was pretty cool. Um, and now I'm also doing mindfulness and meditation virtually. Um, I took a training and I'm a Karoo mindfulness and meditation teacher and it's for emerging adults ages 18 through 29, which really anybody can use it, but it's geared towards college age students. So having you know just different activities available and um letting the students know we usually send them out by email and social media so i think we've had you know great success as far as the program get, goes during COVID. of course there is obstacles like some people do prefer in person they need the um, social interaction face-to-face -face interaction so and now it's been, we've been doing so many Zoom meetings, just everybody's Zoomed out at this point. So that's another obstacle that we're facing right now. So at the beginning, it went really, really well. And now it's just everybody's Zoomed out. So we've had successes and obstacles both. Thanks, Annette. Yeah, I think the Zoom fatigue is real for everyone. Also, welcome to our Zoom meeting. Um, anyone else want to talk a little bit about obstacles and opportunities you faced during COVID? Um, yeah, you, like Annette was saying, it really, for us, it kind of widened our reach. And students who, we are in a place, an actual place on campus that some students find it difficult to get to. And so being able to, you know, sign in wherever they're at, we actually found as a win. All right, well, I will move on to the next one. So this is another audience question. Um, there's a need for persons in recovery in the healthcare and behavioral health professions um, because life experiences really can inform care. Do you all think there are barriers to students in recovery pursuing healthcare professions and education? Have you experienced this personally? I'll say from my perspective, um, you know, Andrew and I are both people in long-term recovery who have gotten into this specific field. And, you know, I think there's a lot of people in recovery who, who like we've talked about, want to give back and they have this lived experience, whether, whether it's from them or maybe a loved one, 
you know, anyone who's working with addiction has been touched by it in some way. Um, for me, I never personally felt a barrier because uh, of my background, but there was a question that we were going to talk about of um, stigma. And so that might also play a role in this if people have experienced, you know, any stigma or stereotyping, um, you know, judgments made just about their past. I can go ahead and um, answer this one too. So yeah, I definitely um, have had both stigma and barriers of affect me during this um, this road in recovery. You know, just because I'm not in recovery doesn't mean I get everything back. I also have um, a criminal background, so that has been a huge barrier in obtaining jobs. You know, a lot of places. You, I mean, if you're a felon, it's you got to go through a background check, and I'm not going to pass. Even though I do have a college degree, I am in recovery, I still have that on my background. So that has been um, a barrier. And the stigma, like, a lot of people think that just because that they are a felon or they have other um, stuff on their background that they can't go to college, that that's just out that can't get financial aid that's just out of the water which those things are untrue and me and Susie and the other coaches have you know tried to reduce that stigma by educating people that it is possible to be a felon and get your master's degree in social work or you know there, there's just so much stigma against it so we've been doing our best to try to educate and it has affected me but I've overcome those barriers. Thank you, Annette. Um, we will move on to the next one. So as Kathy pointed out earlier, um, you know, George Doherty said one of the most important components of a collegiate recovery program is having fun, you know, because no one wants to join if you're just a bunch of sad sacks in a room by yourself. So having fun. And if we know that that's at the forefront, um, the question is, are there any other important components that you feel are missing from your program um, or that you would like to see incorporated? Well, I wanna speak up about that. Um, I think not only fun, but changing the stigma, and it kind of uh, goes back to the last one. I think the boldness of the individuals who've come out, spoken freely to groups, um, marched down the parade for homecoming. Uh, and when we did that, there was a whole slew of people and the claps and the, you know, right on helped change because it's in everyone's life somewhere. And I think that it's so important to stand up and speak. And though when Drew went down to those schools and spoke to all the students, I mean, you could hear a pin drop and they all came up forward and thanked him. That's what's really going to help, you know, I think. And so I think standing up. Yeah, Kathy, I think that's a great point. I think another thing that you know, we wanted to talk a little bit about um, is the importance of building a culture of recovery on campus, because it's not enough, in my opinion, to just have, here's a singular program that is for people in recovery. It's, you know, having that institutional knowledge and that buy-in. Um, Andrew and I have spent a lot of time this semester doing recovery ally trainings, virtual um, recovery ally trainings, because our goal is if people can understand what we're saying when we talk about recovery and who we are and who we serve, um, you know, it is going to break down some stigma and doing this sort of stigma reduction education in turn will hopefully build a culture of recovery. I think, I think a great way to do it too is, is even before like speaking to the high schools as a W collegiate recovery member, um, getting the word out to these young kids that when they get to college, there is a safe place for them, you know, cause it's not just people in recovery. So 
uh, not only reaching out to the college kids that are in college, but giving them a little heads up that, you know, we have a place, you know, it's there before they even come to WVU. Be awesome. Absolutely, Drew. That's such a good point. I'm going to bounce off that a little bit, if you don't mind. Um, and the, you know, changing the narrative of your campus um, to be recovery friendly. That's, that's literally it is... You know, we talk about that trauma-informed campus, that recovery-friendly campus, and, you know, what makes up a recovery-friendly campus. And the biggest thing overall that makes up, you know, a recovery-friendly campus, besides, of course, having recovery supports, being, you know, mindful of people who are in recovery, is changing that narrative of the, the normality or the social expectation for students to drink or for students to you know, experiment with drugs. Because um, a lot of, you know, how people really get into heavy use is it's normalized. You know, how do you know that you're having a problem with alcohol if, you know, all of your friends are drinking weekly, daily? How do you know if you have a problem with this? If that's the norm for you and your peer group, and that's the expected norm that adults on your campus have for you as well. Um, so it's really changing that narrative of, you know, that's not normal use if you're not able to get to class, if you're using to, you know, keep withdrawals at bay and really, you know, getting in there with people and talking about those, you know, signs and symptoms and talking about, you know, we have a responsibility to take care of our students and make sure that they're being safe. So, and that's been the easiest one overall. <laughs> Everybody's pretty on board with it. <laughs> Thanks, Jamie. Yeah, I think absolutely. Um, you know, we know that colleges are typically abstinence hostile environments. And so it's changing that, which is a, I mean, a huge overhaul, right? But it starts in those little ways by having those conversations. Um, you know, some of the information that was shared earlier is college students are usually under the impression that more of their peers are using substances than actually are. And so having those conversations, um, sharing that information. Um, all right, guys, so our next question from the audience is, do you have any trouble getting off-campus partners to join um, with your program or partner up? Well, I'll say we didn't. Um, we really found, I mean, we had to make calls and ask rotaries, would you like to have someone speak? And everyone jumped at it. Um, you know, you, you go to your churches, you go to your, you know, any kind of civic uh, group. And again, my thanks to the students who would go and talk to those groups. And that's where we really got, you know, a lot of our fundings for our, some of our activities is because they were really moved to do so. So getting off campus and, and and I know Drew took it on himself to get in touch with different schools um, to go speak to them. Thanks, Kathy. Yeah, I also think um, not only off-campus partners, but like we can't deny the importance of on-campus partners. Uh, at WVU, our program is small but mighty. But one of the things we've been doing is partnering with other larger programs and groups. Um, Andrew and I just met with some students from Greek Life last week, and it's those larger entities, you know, if we can partner up with them, then more people know about us too. And it's some of those collaborations that you may not think at first, like Greek Life and Collegiate Recovery, but those might be the people that need you. And so we have found a lot of success, you know, partnering with our School of Public Health, my background's in public health, um, social work, we have an addiction study. So start with some of those, you know, partnerships that really make the most sense. Um, and for us, that's really been a great way to build connections across the university. And then we get referrals too. The more people that know about us, the more students are going to know about us. Um, okay, guys, so our next question is about recovery allies. So um, in what ways can we engage recovery allies? What can people who aren't in recovery themselves do to help or support our programs? 
recently um i just did a rich training with the faculty and staff the recovery is spoken well me and jamie both did jamie mostly <laughs> recovery is spoken here ally training um and man it was a huge success i had i think about 60 some faculty and staff participate um and we made stickers and magnets that says recovery ally to and a certificate for taking the training. Um, it went really well. And I had a lot of people um, asking questions and very interested and they they wanna help. They just, you know, a lot of times they don't know how. And that's some part of my job is to educate them of, you know, different signs of someone that might be struggling or have a substance use disorder or a mental health challenge. You know, the list goes on and on. And I'm here, you know, to support and walk with the students, you know, without judgment. So. Thank you, Annette. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like I mentioned, Andrew and I have been doing recovery ally trainings this semester. And really, it's empowering people who are not themselves in recovery to know some of the language, um, to have a bit of an understanding, because you know, you don't have to be a clinician, you don't have to be an expert, but to have a little bit better understanding of what someone is going through, of, you know, addiction and recovery as a long-term process, um, that I think is really important. And at West Virginia University specifically, our program is open to anyone in recovery from anything. So specifically eating disorders and disordered eating um, is something that we've been talking about a lot this semester. So also arming people with that information um, has been, I mean, it's been a real win for us because people did not know that that was something that we also work with. So again, just getting that knowledge out there. Does anyone else wanna talk about how to engage recovery allies or what people can do if they themselves are not in recovery to support programs or people who are? And real quick. Um, so like Annette said, we did Recovery is Spoken here for some Bridge Valley folks. And um, I mean, we've been doing Recovery is Spoken here since I started this time last year um, on Marshall's campus. Um, and during that time, we've also created a Marshall Ally Recovery training that is specific for Marshall. Um, and for engagement, I mean, one thing is really just finding people who are interested. Um, anytime we do speak, I always get, you know, it's impossible at this point to walk in a room and not find at least three to five people who have been impacted in some way by addiction. And I don't just mean, you know, substance use, it's, you know, mental health, um, you know, disordered eating. Everybody has something that they are recovering from you know, that might be a bad breakup, <laughs> you know, it might be, you know, you know, not great parents, it might be childhood trauma, but whatever it is, everybody is recovering from something. And getting people to understand that first, that has been the biggest help overall, is going through and explaining that recovery is more than one thing. And really, the overall for engaging allies is just teaching advocacy. That's the kind of basic thing that we do is teaching people, you know, the empathy that goes along with advocating for a group that you might not be a part of. And at the end of the day, a lot of people are really down for that. And that makes me really happy. It makes me feel good on the inside. Thank you, Jamie. Yeah, you know, empathy and compassion are two of the strongest tools you can have as, a, as an ally. Um, and just being an active listener, we talk a lot in our trainings of like, these are just good life skills, <laughs> learning how to do reflective listening. Um, okay, we've got another question, Annette, that kind of came up after um, talking about some justice-based experiences. So the question is, do any of you educate uh, non-traditional students on the opportunities they could have by furthering their education after being incarcerated, such as going into prison systems and sharing information? Um, has anyone done any of that in their program or is it something you've thought about doing? We have, pre-COVID, we um, had some stuff set up with the some of the sober living houses to go there um, 
as far as DOC goes, we I haven't made a connection there yet. I honestly don't know if I'm allowed to go there. So um, we probably have to send somebody else. But I do have a friend that is um, working in the um, DOC system that advocates and educates um, for Vivitrol. So she's in there. I, so I have that connection there. I just need to look into it further. So that's all I got for that. Thanks, Annette. Um, another question kind of about collaborations, connections. Uh, has anyone had experience with successful interdepartmental collaborations, such as with student conduct, student legal services, housing? I know we have, um, you know, worked on recovery housing over the years. And actually right now we are partnering with a community group and we found out that the financial aid package um, for our students would cover recovery housing in the community, which is a big win for us. Um, but in order to do that, we had to work within, you know, the interdepartmental group of, of housing and residence life. Um, some of our, you know, strongest partnerships are with our counseling center and then also our student assistance program, because as has been said earlier, you know, collegiate recovery is not a, it's not a counseling group. You know, we are not clinical. Um, we're there for support, but you know, these are the experts that we want to go to. So building those relationships, I think has been really important for us for referrals and just for internal support. I'll say one really cool example of working with another department within WBU was our work with the Adventure West Virginia program. So we started doing some smaller trips. We went mountain biking with a group of students in recovery in Blackwater Canyon. We even, we had a week long rafting trip um, planned to go to Utah during spring break this year. It's gotten postponed, um, but we definitely, that's, I think that's part of like having fun, but we've also developed um, programming with Adventure West Virginia designed to not only build community among our students, but also to uh, promote resilience and grit in our students. And that's, that's one collaboration I'm super excited about. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, I think that sometimes it's thinking of those creative, you know, non-traditional um, connections such as We've also done um, a lunch with a dietitian series where the uh, registered dietitian for the university comes and now is doing it virtually, um, you know, does a little lesson on how to cook something easy because we know that in recovery, it's not just, okay, now I'm in recovery, I'm good. It's what about all the other elements of your life and, you know, balanced eating as a part of that. Um, sometimes it's learning, relearning things like how to cook, you know, healthy meals. Um, anyone else on that, on collaborations? Okay, so the next question is, um, describe some of the successes and challenges of starting a collegiate recovery program or kind of being on that ground level. So Kathy, that might be something you could speak to. As I mentioned, I think the successes were just the uh, groups of people who came forward who wanted to offer their skills or their talents um, and who were so willing to do so. I mean, that was probably the best. And every time, you know, it was to me, Susie was with me when we had started. And I'll tell you, I did not know what we were gonna come out with. She kept smiling at me saying, Kathy, it's gonna work. You're gonna see it's gonna work. <laughs> and uh, then she got to go on to the national level, but I was sitting there going, oh no, thank God there was Andrew and Weiss who showed up and, uh, and Olivia. But you know, it was truly the the hope that this will work. And, and Andrew and I often were just sitting there, I know, 
you know, I was scared. <laughs> and he kept saying, Kathy, I'm here and we're and I'm having a good time and it's okay. And if you have one person, and I want to thank him so much for that. So not being worried that, you know, sometimes the numbers would go down. And then last fall, my goodness, we had like 200 and some people one week. So it, it really was either feast or famine and not to be scared about that. I think that's what I really want to impress is that, you know, you go through those highs and lows or when everybody graduates and you have to start all over again and think, oh my goodness, you know, we've got an empty house. Um, they come, they'll come back. So uh, I think never to lose hope. Thanks, Kathy. Yeah, Andrew's still talking people down off the ledge. Me, it's me now. <laughs> yeah, but you're absolutely right. You know, it's it's if you can reach one person, you're going to reach others. Um, a question that came in earlier in the chat, which we kind of talked about a little is, you know, how do you suggest getting students engaged? And one of the things I know that we have done is really, you know, pulling the audience. What do you guys want to do? What are the things that interest you? We don't want to just throw a bunch of programs at you that no one really cares about. And, you know, we'll try anything um, because it's not just, we do have recovery meetings every day and that's very important, but it's also just, you know, life experiences, it's activities, it's doing things with people who are also, you know, in recovery or recovery supportive. Um, so panelists, we are nearing the end of our time. So the last question I'm gonna pose and I would love if everyone could answer is um, what's the number one thing you want people to know about your collegiate recovery program or collegiate recovery in general? It's an easy one, just a light question to end it. I would just say that you're welcome. You know, you're welcome in our community. Um, we're here, we're available, and we're glad to support you in any way we can. The clarity it gives me to, to, in all corners of my life, you know, it's, it's such a tool for, it's so broad, you know, there's, there's always an answer for, for the questions that I have always. Um, as far as Bridge Valley and our program goes, I just, you know, like everybody to know that it's not just recovery from alcohol or drugs. It can be recovery from anything, um, mental health, sex addiction, gambling, eating disorder, divorce, grief, um, the list goes on and on. And everybody, like they were saying, everyone's welcome. And I am here to help and support in every way I can. And I guess I think that for WVU Collegiate Recovery Program, it is for everyone. It helps you be a better person. Um, you, each person's unique. And I know that my time there helped me to know really, you know, how I wanted to live my retirement. <laughs> I think I would want um, people to know that recovery in general is for everyone. Um, and that, you know, especially here on our campus, and on, I know your guys' campuses as well, that everyone's welcome and that we're not going to make that judgment because recovery is for everyone. Thank you all. Um, so we're just about out of time. I really want to thank everyone for joining us on our panel. Um, you guys, your ideas, your experience, it's invaluable. Um, so to all of our attendees, remember to complete the sign-in sheet and evaluation. But before our break, I'm going to pass it over to Susie Mullins for a very special announcement. Well, this has been a great uh, session. I really appreciate everybody sharing um, their experiences. Um, you know, when we started, uh, when I joined Kathy at WVU, <clears throat> um, 
we went to as many collegiate recovery programs as we could to look around and see what other people were doing, what their space looked like to just get a landscape. And, you know, the job that I had before I joined Kathy allowed me the, the privilege to do a lot of travel. And so I would, whatever city I was in, I would look it up and see if they had collegiate recovery. And if they did, I'd, you know, hunt them down and, and go visit them and, you know, pick their brains um, to see, you know, what were they doing? And really, uh, if you've seen one collegiate recovery program, you've seen one collegiate recovery program. And you, that's a bit of a double-edged sword because a lot of times we want um, some solid direction. We want a recipe of how to make this uh, successful. And, you know, each, um, each program develops its own uh, personality, you know, develops, develops its own um, mission, so to speak. And so that's the, the piece about not giving up, uh, not losing faith that, you know, what needs to show up will show up uh, when it's supposed to. And, you know, to just keep, you know, hold steady and keep doing programming, uh, even if nobody shows up, because someday someone might show up. And, you know, that's okay, because when that one person shows up, you don't know if that's going to be uh, the, the next Olivia, you don't know if that's going to be Andrew or Jamie or Drew or Annette, or, you know, any of the hundreds of students across the country whose lives have been changed and supported by collegiate recovery. Um, so, you know, definitely uh, don't give up and, and keep that faith. I'm going to sh share my screen here just a second. Um, so as we were planning this, we wanted to uh, present an award of appreciation, and um, I, can, I can solidly say that the West Virginia Collegiate Recovery Network would not be a thing. Uh, we would probably not be in existence without... Um, the foundation that was laid by WVU, without the foundation that was uh, inspired by uh, Dr. Yura at WVU. Um, you know, her willingness to say yes to just about anything uh, both inspired me and terrified me <laughs> during the time that we worked together. And um, so we really wanted to take the opportunity to recognize her and present her oh, with my first collegiate recovery. Oh my, <laughs> Susie, I, this wouldn't have happened without you. <laughs> so Kathy, this is your oh, award that oh, we're presenting God. with to you virtually. Oh, um, this oh, is a piece of West Virginia glass with uh, a, a, our logo from the West Virginia Collegiate Recovery Network and a little plaque that you'll receive in the mail. Um, oh my word! <laughs> we weren't able to to pull it off to get it to you in person. Um, oh my! That so. I am so touched, and I tell you, I've never had been so uh, cared about in my forty years at WVU. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I thank you, thank you, and Susie, it wouldn't have happened without you, dear. It wouldn't have. I would have run to the hills, you know. <laughs> <laughs> retired earlier <laughs> but I want to thank you all I am touched incredibly and uh, and you know over and above thank you well we really appreciate you and everything that you've brought to WVU everything you've brought to West Virginia um, again your your willingness to say yes uh, and I think that's just, that's part of the spirit of collegiate recovery. And, you know, we say yes, we see what happens. If it doesn't work, we do something different. You know, it's, it's uh, keeping that flexibility and that willingness, you know, those, those principles of recovery and, you know, how we do this, um, how we do this work every day. And, you know, there are definitely days like you've heard other presenters talk about that it's not easy. And you think, man, is this, are we doing anything? Um, and then, you know, you hear stories and you talk to people and, you know, 
see what students are doing with their lives. And, you know, it absolutely is 110% worth it. And, you know, we would not be um, in the position we are in West Virginia without uh, the inspiration provided by, by Kathy. So we wanted to, to honor and recognize her for um, that pioneering work because, uh, you know, the slogan is Mountaineers go first. But I'm telling you what, pioneering is what's really hard because you've got to sell things to people that they don't think they need in terms of a, a lot of times in administration. Um, but because of the progress that's been made, uh, that's it's not such a hard sell anymore. Um, Thank you. I mean, I'm really touched. I can't believe this. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a private therapist now and you know, I wasn't so sure that was such a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> because I was having a lot of fun in collegiate recovery. <laughs> well, you are Thank always you. welcome. I can, I can firmly speak, I think, for every collegiate recovery program in the country. Uh, you are always welcome at any, any program. And, Thank you know, you. I think that's the other thing that's so inspiring is, you know, this this area of our profession, um, the people who work in this are always willing to share, uh, you know, what they've learned, the resources. Um, it, it's just really, when you talk about collegiality, it is is second to none of, of anything I've seen in almost 30 years. So I'm really, thank you so much. Thank you. We really appreciate you, Kathy, and, and we'll get you your, we'll get you the real award in the mail. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Susie, could I take a minute? Sure. Okay, I'd like to tell those that have collegiate recovery programs, there is a group you can uh, collaborate with that I think is very worthwhile, Healthy Grand Families. Uh, it's a educational program, last 12 weeks, I believe. For, for grandparents who are raising grandchildren or great-grandchildren. And West Virginia has a huge need for this. Uh, one of the sections in the training is uh, substance use disorder. And uh, so I'm doing that here in Mercer County with our healthy grand families. And probably in each of your areas, there's a, there's a healthy grand family group. Uh, great organization. Thanks, Mike. That's as, a, as is West Virginia Collegiate Recovery Network. Don't forget that. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. That's that's a great resource. And, and the other um, piece is that, you know, we're here to support students who may not have experienced substance use disorder themselves, um, but here as support for family members and uh, friends, because, you know, there's there's so many people who have been traumatized by what's happened with their loved ones, uh, whether they've been lost um, to an overdose or, or related death, um, be it a, a death related to suicide and those type of things. And so we're, you know, we're, uh, as, as Joe Deegan would say, an all comers uh, type of atmosphere that, you know, anybody's welcome. And, you know, when we first started at Collegiate Recovery at WVU, um, there were a lot of programs that weren't doing that. It was more exclusive than inclusive. And, you know, in, in typical Kathy style, she says, you know, well, let, let, bring them all, everybody, come on in. And, you know, I think that has been, um, that's been a tremendous, uh, tremendous asset. 